My name is Roger Armstrong. I was born a psychic child in 1930. Protective intention attached. PIA, to prevent misuse. Hello, this is psychic training number six. Remote viewing and use of psychic abilities in art. So I had them build a life-size head out of toothpicks. Okay, they could break the toothpick and make round surfaces, but they glued the toothpicks up uh, to make a portrait head. And they were astonishingly beautiful. I taught them how to look into things. Now, I'm telepathic, so I was able to help them enter things with their mind. One of the first things we did was an orange. I brought an orange for everybody. And we peeled the orange and twisted the orange and smelled the orange oil and tasted the orange oil. We took a section of the orange out and we ate it and we crushed it with our tongue so we would taste all the juices. Then we went inside to feel these emotions of the orange and the orange had emotions and it was very pleased that it was being used that it was participating for the benefit of others but once the students got inside with their mind they could see the structure of the orange they could see how the orange was formed it was very interesting So then, one day we're looking at some, uh, we're o over at the College Art Gallery, and I said, uh, we can go into an orange, what happens if we go into a painting? And so everybody stands in front of a painting and goes into the painting. With their minds, of course. Well, what did you find? Every brushstroke, Mr. Armstrong, tells a story. So if you touch these different brush strokes, you hear the voice of the artist telling the story of why that was there. I said, wow. So they thought it would be fun to use this discovery and explore it some more. So we, or I, set up a, a, a field trip, and we went to the uh, Detroit uh, uh, Museum of Art, and we viewed uh, the old masters and the young moderns, and we made up together, we made up a uh, questionnaire of questions they were to answer. Uh, you know, what was the painting, when was it painted, who painted it, and then what was the most significant thing you saw when you went inside, and uh, uh, what was the most surprising thing, and uh, a couple of other questions. And then they could add their own, uh, what they felt was significant information. Now, I hadn't thought of remote viewing in this fashion before. I mean, this was astonishing to me. And when you have 150 kids all standing 10 foot from a painting and then walking up to it slowly uh, to open up a portal with their mind, that's the technique we developed, uh, with their hands behind their back and they stop a foot and a half to two foot from the painting and then stand there for two or three minutes uh, the guards recognize this as unusual behavior. <laughs> and so one of the guards stopped one of the kids and says, what are you doing? And the young, two sixth grade boys told him what we were doing and says, I don't believe you're doing that. And the boys said, well, would you like to experience it? 
Said, what do you mean? Well, we'll teach you how. So they connected with him telepathically and as, once in position and walked up to the painting. And I think it was a painting by Delacroix with the uh, a tiger rising up. And once you got in the painting, uh, you saw that you were in his studio and you saw that he had set up the whole thing like a still life. And there was a stuffed horse and a stuffed tiger in the position of attacking the horse. And he just added more life to it with his painting. Well, the guard was just enthralled. You know? And you touch this color and that color, you know, and you could hear Delacroix uh, complaining uh, that these stuffed animals cost so much money he was going to have to do something different next time, you know, or he was going to have to buy them and use them again. The guard got so excited, he called up to the lounge and had all the other guards came to come down, and the kids uh, paired off, uh, volunteered, and helped, had each kid, had each uh, uh, guard learn how to remote view into the paintings. Now, there was one painting, and we would do this several times during the year, and the guards, when they heard we were coming, would give a list of uh, give a list of uh, paintings that thought would be fun for us to look to look at. During one of our times, the kids were looking at a painting by Monet. It's called The Picnic. And it's a glade like this, trees on either side going a long distance. And in the center of the painting, there's a picnic taking place and uh, very voluptuous women are on the laps of uh, very elegant dressed men with top hats and, and uh, uh, bow ties and starched, you know, shiny lapels, all that kind of stuff. And I went, and as I was going around the gallery looking, uh, I felt that there was, uh, in one gallery, there was a little bit of excitement. Um, we're all kind of empathically or telepathically connected, empathically if not telepathically. So I was there by myself with uh, 150, 160 kids. And so I go to this uh, one gallery and there's a, a lineup of maybe 20 kids and they're standing there for three or four seconds and then moving and another, another person's there. And they saw me and they all scattered. Well, now, you know, when they all scatter. So I grabbed a hold of one of the kids that was walking away, and I said, what's going on? And she says, oh, Mr. Armstrong, off to the side of the painting, in some bushes, there's a couple doing it. And they're changing the way they're doing it a lot. I said, wow, that's certainly not part of Delacroix, I mean, certainly not part of Monet's painting. And she said, no, no, she says it's off to the sign. She said, the actual painting is very disappointing. I said, oh, okay. So I went and viewed, and yeah, you looked at the glade and there was nobody. The glade was empty. And you looked over to the right, and in some scanty bushes, there was a couple. Uh, they weren't doing it when I was watching. They were getting their clothes on. Now, the interesting thing was, the painting was done in 1870-something. These, this young couple were putting on contemporary clothing. The street behind them had 1958 automobiles. The people on the street were dressed like 1958. That's the year we visited and we viewed. So I, I spread the word as, as the, the kids that were seeing the, the, anybody looked at the Monet picnic, you know, and saw the couple. What happened to the people that were in the glade? Did anybody check on them? And uh, 
uh, uh, several kids said, yeah, I did. And uh, they're in his studio. He drew the women first and had them arranged on, uh, on uh, uh, chairs and little scaffoldings. And then he had the men come and posed later. I said, now, you all be sure to write all of this down on your, on your description sheet. And when we got back, I'm meeting with each class separately over the week. And it was interesting talking with them about how, what did we see? We go in and we look at the glade as it was in, as, as Monet saw it in 1870-something. Or maybe he made his sketches before that. We don't know for sure. And then you go to his studio and the women are posing and the men are posing. You can figure, okay, that was two or three weeks apart. All right. Then you looked over to the right and you saw this couple in the bushes with contemporary clothing. And you look beyond that and you see a contemporary street. And so we talked about remote viewing and what time is. And how in one thing could we see all of these variations. So when we looked at the glade as Monet saw it, we saw it at one time. His studio drawings, we saw two different times, and the street and the, and the young couple, the third. So within seconds, or linked to each other, we saw one, two, three, four, five, six time zones through one remote viewing. Fascinating. Now, remote viewing is just detaching your viewing and sending it out, projecting it out with your mind. You can join an object at that distance, I mean, at that, in that time frame, uh, and I call that uh, you're in possession. Uh, you aren't controlling as much as you are just inside seeing what they're seeing. Uh, maybe a form of channeling in, in, in that respect. Uh, then there's just viewing the object from, the, from, from things. Now, what we were doing, going inside things, is we were participating. So possessing, participating, and just viewing. One of my favorite things, uh, and I haven't done it in a long time, but as a young man, uh, I like to lay on my back in a field and watch the hawk over my head soar, and I could join and see what he saw. Really interesting, you know, to see me be in his focus, and then ignored, you know because I'm too large. I'm not a, I'm not a, uh, um, a food object, especially since I was moving. Now, this is Roger Armstrong, and I'm always interested in your comments.